Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you are today. My name is Chantal Warner. I'm one of the two co-directors of CIRCLE, the Center for Educational Resources and Culture, Language, and Literacy, the host of this event, and I'm really happy to see you all here again for today's webinar. Um, I have, uh, in addition to our speaker, who I'll introduce in a second, I have here with me uh, my colleague Beatrice Dupuy, who's the co-director of the center, Kate Mackay, who's our associate director, and Sochil Coronado Vargas, who is our um, uh, outreach coordinator, and they'll be working with me and kind of coordinating all of your questions and any problems that you have uh, during this event. This is, as some of you know, because I see some familiar names, the final webinar in our series on social justice in the language classroom. Um, and we're really happy to have Michelle uh, Nicola here today with us. Um, I do want to mention also uh, a couple of things. For those of you who aren't familiar with CIRCLE, uh, we are one of 16 title uh, Title VI Language Resource Centers that are funded through the Department of Education. Uh, and so if this is the first event that's brought you to us um, after this event, I encourage you to visit our website, which you'll find there, and look at the other kinds of resources and professional development opportunities that we have. Uh, and also to go to uh, nflrc.org, which is a kind of a hotspot for all of the 16 centers. So you can find out some of the work that the other centers are doing too. We collaborate a lot um, and provide a really wonderful, I think, set of different kinds of support for foreign language educators. All right. Um, I also want to mention, oh, this is the end of this webinar series, but we do have a new webinar series that's going to be starting up uh, just next month, and that's focused on literacy-based lesson planning. It's a three-part webinar series, um, and we have some wonderful speakers coming, so you'll see some information there about where to go to register for that. It's um, another free series just like this one, um, and so please, if you've enjoyed the webinars that we've had for you so far this semester, uh, come and check those out as well. All right, it's now my very, very great pleasure to welcome Michelle Nicola. She's currently an instructional coach at Grant High School, um, but she's taught Spanish at pretty much every level, elementary, middle school, and high school, I think. Um, she's also taught courses on equity and social justice at George Fox University. And she was a Teaching Tolerance Excellence in Education awardee in 2014. Um, and this is an award that is in recognition of teachers who really exemplify what it means to prepare students to live in diverse worlds. I think that'll be really relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, and also who stand up against injustice in their roles as educators. She was also in 2018 a Fulbright Scholar and traveled to Mexico to research and collect Afro-Mexican stories. Um, I'm, it sounds like a very exciting project. She's written a number of articles for Rethinking Schools magazine. She's presented to Actful and Northwest Teachers for Social Justice. And I want to highlight one article in particular um, that I found while I was preparing the bio for this, which is, I think, um, something that was written in as part of her um, reception of this award from Teaching Tolerance. And it's an article called The Case for Love in the Classroom. Um, and I'm going to actually share the link in the chat because it's such a beautiful piece. I'm going to share it with all of the instructors I work with because um, it's a good reminder about how important um, bringing that love of all of our students to the classroom, even on the days where they don't like us and we don't like them, is um, it's a really lovely piece. Um, so Please join me in welcoming Michelle and Nicola, and I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say about considerations for social justice, teaching in a world language setting from self to students to world. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Chantel. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and get started by sharing my screen. All right, we're ready. So welcome, everyone. It's thank you. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for showing up to this um, webinar today. It really, it's inspiring, it means a lot, and I, I appreciate you. Um, so, as Chantel said, my name is Michelle, um, Michelle Nicola. I have been in the US education system for about the past 12 years. I currently do instructional coaching, and I'm also working with the Environmental Justice Club at um, Grant High School, and I mentioned that because um, in our first meeting, environmental justice, uh, the students shared kind of why they were joining the club. And again and again, students shared that they were um, feeling hopeful and excited about the future. And I don't know how many of you have seen this um, piece that Arundhati Roy wrote about the pandemic, where she said the pandemic is a portal. And I would argue that we have 
many portals opening up right now, many opportunities to create a new world. Um, and it's with that wave of optimism that I am offering this webinar to you, my friends. Okay, so we're gonna start today as I always start my classes. Um, this is a poem by Luis Valdez, the father of Teatro Campesino. Um, it came to me through Curtis Acosta and his documentary, Precious Knowledge. And um, I would just invite you to kind of take a moment to just take a deep breath and let it out. And if you speak Spanish, you can join me in saying the whole thing. And if you speak English, you can join me in saying the English parts. Everybody's on mute, but we're going to go ahead and say this collectively together. It starts, in la quesh, tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. Si te hago daño a ti, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mi mismo. I do harm to myself. Si te amo y respeto, if I love and respect you, me amo y respeto yo. I love and respect myself. And so it's with this that I want to center our work today when love and in action. I also want to take a moment to do a moment where we recognize the lands that we are on and where we pause and think about who did these lands belong to before they were colonized. Um, so I'm from Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Oregon, Oregon occupies land that belongs to the Clackamas, Cowlitz, Chinook, and Multnomah peoples. And I would just ask you to think about where are you? And who did the lands that you stand on belong to before European colonization? Or if you're from in, in another country, what are the indigenous people, who are the indigenous peoples that live among you? Um, so one of the things that this land recognition does, and I do do it in Spanish every day, that we do in Lakesh and we start our class with a land recognition. And last year, one of my students, um, Ben, he had just moved to Portland from Montana. He is, he's indigenous and he is very connected with his, with his tribe in Montana. And I, you know, I kind of thought like this land recognition, it's kind of a paltry, paltry at best way to honor indigenous peoples. Um, but Ben, you know, when it came time to conferences, I met with Ben's mother and he, and she was like, oh, you're the, Ben told me about you. He really appreciates that you do that land recognition. So sometimes these little things that we do actually make a big impact for the students who we are teaching. Um, and Verna St. Denise, I heard a talk that she did and she was quoting the work of Patrick Wolf. And they said that settler colonists have developed complex narratives that erase indigenous people's humanity. And that is partly accomplished by perpetuating the belief in empty land. So your first social justice task, if you don't know already, um, is to find out whose land are you standing on? And so I'm gonna go ahead and start just giving you an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. I've kind of developed, um, divided this presentation into three different sections. Um, so the first is just to kind of get some definitions down. Um, you know, there's not one, there are things that social justice teaching is not, but there are many definitions about what it is. So I will share a few. Um, in the self, I'm gonna give you three books to consider. Um, for students, we're gonna talk about systems, curriculum, and collaboration, and then world is gonna be our call to action. And the goal really for us today is that everyone answers a call to action. So we take action on just one of the considerations for self, students, and or world. Okay, so this graphic comes from Zaretta Hammond. If you don't know Zaretta Hammond, I highly encourage you check her out. She has a book called um, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. It is amazing, it, like in a word, it is amazing. Um, but she really goes through like how culturally responsive teaching is connected to brain science and actually physical things that happen in our bodies. Um, and she also 
in her presentations delineates and makes these very clear distinctions between the difference of multicultural education, social justice, and culturally responsive pedagogy. I added that little blurb about anti-racist education, taking the definition from teaching tolerance, um, because that is, that's something that we're hearing a lot about these days. And like I said, while there isn't like, um, there aren't necessarily set definitions, there are things that these things are not. So for example, culturally responsive pedagogy is really about creating independent learners. Whereas social justice teaching is raising consciousness and about changing beliefs and ways of being. So for me, the way I think about social justice teaching, like in a nutshell, it means interrupting predictable outcomes. So for me, what I ask myself is what actions am I taking to interrupt predictable outcomes? And here's the first time I'm gonna ask you to maybe type something in the chat, like what does social justice education mean for you in your practice? So we've got making students aware of their contextual realities, identifying and challenging power, examining existing historical positions of power, um, awareness of one's own culture and the recognition of others' funds of knowledge. These are great. Uh, raising, <laughs> uh, raising awareness where it was not before, um, creating awareness and sociocultural acknowledgement of social, cultural, and political inequalities, giving all students a voice. Um, it involves gender equity, uh, and then somebody's saying, and I think that's also a completely suitable response that uh, this is new and still forming definitions. I think that's why we're all here too. Um, yeah. And teaching to support students to recognize rights, citizenship and social inequalities in society, recognizing that others are not treated the same and then asking what we can do about it, mm -hmm. recognizing the existence of self and others, um, having heritage Spanish speakers feel that they too are the owners of the Spanish language and that they feel empowered by their bilingualism. CC, yes. Mm -hmm. um, bringing students to see closer other people's lives and to create critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Integrity and equality, recognizing bias, looking at historical past and multiple perspectives. Um, and then Charmin shares um, that they have over 36 minority communities. So if in that context, I think recognizing that language rights um, is part should be part of education policy and planning contributes mm -hmm. to social justice. Um, there's more than one story. Mm -hmm. Yes, these are all amazing. These are great. Thank you, Chantel. This is this is great. Yes, 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 yes. A thousand times yes to all of these things. So, you know, I just want to surface like. I'm here giving this presentation and but everyone watching it. You already have like we have the collective knowledge of what this means, right? And here, we're here today to just share ideas around how we can do this and, um, and, and continue to do this work. Okay, so the first kind of broad category that I want us to consider is ourselves. And um, so in her book, Coaching for Equity, Elena Aguilar says, we must address the thinking, feeling, and believing of anyone who works in schools if we intend to change the experience and outcomes for children of color. How do we do that? So I think the first part is to explore one's own racial identity. And there are so many books and so many resources that you can use to do this. The one that I'm currently working with is the Racial Healing Handbook. Um, and this book has reflection questions for people of color and for white people because racial identity development travels similar but different trajectories for both of us. Um, and it guides on a path for um, healing from racism and noticing it so that we can stop participating in it. Um, so, and it really, the first chapter is all about exploring your own racial identity. and. This is super important because whether you think this is happening or not, race is showing up in your classroom. It's showing up. Um, and so this book has given me tools to stay engaged rather than disengage. And having a clear sense of my own identity um, helps me engage in conversations that might be uncomfortable. Um, and it also helps me understand, you know, there, one thing is how I see myself. Another thing is how uh, students see me. And so 
one of the questions that we're asking ourselves is how can we use our unique identity markers to the benefit of all? So at this point, I'm going to give you kind of like a, a I'm going to reintroduce myself, but in a new way. So this is me. <laughs> um, these are some of my more salient identity markers. And I would say um, that the one that shows up most in the classroom is racially ambiguous. So I am fourth generation Lebanese and German. Um, I live in Portland, which if those of you who are not from Portland or maybe outside of the US, Portland is a very large city and it's populated for many historical reasons. It's populated predominantly by white people. Um, and so <laughs> for me growing up, I kind of had this idea that I was, that I was white by default, right? Because I wasn't black, I wasn't Latina, I wasn't Asian and so, and I wasn't indigenous, so I must be white. And it wasn't until I became an adult and really got into the teaching career that I understood why in the US and in my particular context, Lebanese, like a person with a Lebanese and um, German ethnic makeup is considered white, right? But it gets tricky because I walk into the classroom and I'm a Spanish teacher and students are like, Oh, she's Mexican. Like that's just, you know, right away. <laughs> she's Mexican. Um, and so there's this like play of how, how I see myself, how others see me and, and it's complex. It's so super complex. So doing your work on this part and getting clear on what, what has been normed for you and what, how you want to identify is so super important. Um, so it has led me, for me, this journey of like learning about myself racially and, and otherwise and ethnically has led me to a place where I can better answer students' questions. So I remember one time I was teaching and, you know, it was students were working on some activity for Spanish and it was kind of like a moment where people were just kind of having some, some conversation, relaxed conversation. And one of my students, Whitney, says, Miss Nicola, Rose and I were in the hall at lunch talking and, you know, um, what are you? Like, are you part black? <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, why don't you guys, why don't you guys take a guess? Like, I won't be offended by anything you said, you say. And so a lot of them were like, oh, she's Mexican. No, no, she's, she's Jewish. No, she's, the, you know, like all of these different answers. My favorite answer was Cody who said, oh, I think you're white with a permatan. <laughs> and I was like, yes, that's right. <laughs> that's pretty much right. Um, and so, you know, but the other piece, like, that goes a little bit deeper about this self and identity work that we're doing is it allows me, it's allowed me to dig deeper into questions of where whiteness um, shows up in my beliefs. So how does whiteness affect my ideas of right and wrong? Um, my sense of individualism versus community. How does whiteness show up in my notions of respect, of time, um, of what is appropriate behavior for the classroom? And we have to get clear on these things or we end up making assumptions that that's just the way things are, right? So the second, um, book I want to offer. Well, it's actually a series of books. So um, for those of you who don't know of Elena Aguilar, please find her, <laughs> sign up for one of her webinars, sign up for her coaching sessions, buy her books. She is radically changing. Um, she's radically changed how I think about teaching and learning. Um, her two most recent books are Onward, Cultivating Emotionally Res Resilience in the Classroom and Coaching for Equity. I recommend both of these books for anyone involved in education. You don't necessarily have to be an instructional coach to gain benefit from what she has to offer. Um, she also has a podcast, the Bright Morning Podcast. It, that really is, like she did, it's, a, it's brilliant. You need to check it out. Um, I kind of explain her as she's like, for those of you in the US who know Brene Brown, she's like the Brene Brown of educators, but she's really also expanding past that and and like anyone who even people who are not in education. Um, and one of the key things that um, Elena Aguilar has taught me is that 
we need to make space for emotions in our professional lives, period. We need to make space for emotions in the classroom. And, you know, I used to be the teacher. She really did. She changed my beliefs on how, and then in effect, changed my behaviors and how I show up in my classroom. Because I used to be the teacher that would tell students, okay, yeah, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're having such a rough day. I can see that. I know this thing just happened to you. I know it's eating at you. But you know what? When you step into this classroom, we're going to just we're gonna leave that at the door and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna focus on Spanish and we're going to put our intention on having, um, you know, just focus on Spanish and being happy, right? And it's like, oh, what was I thinking? Like, that's not, like any of us who have gone through struggles or grief know that that kind of gnawing feeling in your gut doesn't just go away when you cross a threshold from one room into another, right? And so how do we make space, especially now during a pandemic, how do we make space for students to show up and share their emotions with us? Um, so some of the things that I've done is I have created, you know, sometimes I have students do a take five form where it's just a little sheet of paper and it hangs by the classroom door and they don't have to even ask me, they just maybe make co eye contact with me, grab the sheet of paper, and then they can sit out in the hall and take a break for a minute. And if they want to, they can write to me about what's going on with them. If they, um, and if they don't, they can just sit outside and you know do some deep breathing. The other thing that Elena has really helped me understand is that she presents a model for transformational coaching that says we need to change our behaviors, beliefs, and ways of being. And those of you who were in Stacey Johnson's presentation a couple of weeks ago may see some overlap in this idea of teaching for transformation for our students and for ourselves. So Stacey defined transformative um, learning as adults reevaluating previously held beliefs and attitudes and beginning to interpret an experience in a new way. Um, and she reminds us that it's not an inevitable process and it's not linear and it's not, but it is something that you can um, be intentional about. So one thing that I want everybody to notice right here is in this graphic that Elena Aguilar shares with us, behaviors are just the tip of the iceberg. And so I'll often lead PD and around culturally responsive teaching or around, you know, socio-emotional learning or whatever the case may be. And teachers are just anxious. They want to get started. They want to, you know, they want the worksheet. They want the checklist. They want to know what to do. Can I want to leave here with actionable items? And what I want to suggest is that those things are definitely, they definitely have a role but that's just the tip of the iceberg. So if you are only, like for example, if you are only um, adding more people of color, if you're only increasing the representation in your classroom, but you're not questioning yourself or questioning your colleagues when you hear things like, um, you know, this school isn't for them, for these kids, you're only really getting at the tip of the ice, iceberg, right? If you are saying things like, oh, you know, they tried really hard, so I'm gonna let them pass. Um, that's, that's the work, that's the work right there, your beliefs, getting clear on your beliefs and how they show up and how they influence your behaviors and your ways of being. Um, so that's the base of the pyramid, right? The ways of being. Um, and here's a question for you. And you don't necessarily have to type it in the chat. We're not really gonna talk about it. It's more for personal reflection. But when was the last time that you changed your beliefs about something? And how did that change happen? What led to you changing your beliefs? So the third and final book that I am going to offer to you is this book, Troublemakers by Carla Shalabi. And um, this book, the reason why I chose this book is because it really gives a student's eye view. And it is a second grade student eye view, but I will tell you, as a high school teacher, I learned so much from this book. 
um, it did encourage me to change my practice. It encouraged me to consider questions of love and freedom and how that shows up in the classroom. Um, do my students feel free to be themselves? And how do I know? Do they have a sense of love and belonging? What do I do to find out about that? And so on this slide, I would like to kind of, I would like to recommend that, or I'd like to ask you, how do you reflect on your practice? Um, I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert about this book. Carla Shalabi does not give you a binder. She does not give you a toolkit or a checklist for how to do this. She really ends the, ends the book by saying, our classroom management plan is to be love. That's what we have to do. Um, so then going back to this question, like how do you gather feedback from your students? I, there's a lot of times when teachers will tell me, oh yeah, I have a great relationship with our, my students. And I will ask them, um, okay, great. How do you know that? How do you know? Because sometimes teachers feel like the absence of conflict equals a great relationship. And we wanna be sure about that. We wanna be sure that our students feel that they belong and that we, we have a high regard and care for them. Um, and so some of the ways, you know, how do you gather feedback? Do you switch it up? Like some teachers use a Google form, sometimes a one word check in at the end of the class, um, end of unit self reflections. And here's the kicker. What do you do with the feedback once you have it? So one really powerful um, kind of system that I witnessed some teachers um, in pu put in place was they would gather daily feedback about the lesson from their students. They used a Google form, so it was really quick. You know, tell me one thing you learned. They had a series of questions that they would ask about. They'd look it over, and then the next day they would come back and say, hey, thank you for that feedback. Here are the ways that I changed the lesson based on your feedback. That is really important for young people to hear. Imagine us as adults, all these surveys that we get and we're like, oh, no, is anyone really looking at this? No one's going to take action on this, right? And so one of the ways you can build trust with your student, it, with your classrooms, is saying, okay, yeah, I heard you. You said you want more small group work. So today we're going to do small group work. And maybe you've already planned to do small group work with them anyway. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. That's just a happy coincidence if that happens. Um, but really being explicit about that feedback cycle of not only gathering the feedback, but telling students what you're doing with it. Um, one year in one of my more um, creative attempts to gather feedback, I structured class so there was a class president and they had to run for office and give a little speech in Spanish. And um, that class president on a weekly basis, I would step outside of the classroom, I'd just be kind of like, right at the door so I could still see in. Um, this is with high school too. I wouldn't do this with younger kids. So I was right at the door and the class president would hold a meeting and gather that feedback for me, right? Because we know the conversation changes when we're not in the room. It's the same reason why administrators leave when we have union meetings, right? The conversation changes. So making sure that you're getting that feedback from students in a way that they feel safe, in a way that they feel heard, and in a way that they feel honored is super important. Um, the other question that I want you to consider is how do you show students that you love them? And for some people, love might be too strong a word. That's okay. That you care for them. Um, and if you don't care about them, my next question would be, are you in a good fit school? So I have had this experience of not being in a good fit school of really, really struggling, of ending my days, maybe I didn't end them crying every single day, but very frequently I would end my days totally depleted and exhausted. And it took a lot of self-reflection and a lot of um, really encouraging colleagues and peers to realize that it's not, it's just not a good fit school. And there's no shame in that, right? As teachers, we have different strengths and we have different ways that we are, we're different pieces of this big puzzle, right? We don't have to do it all. So that is another piece that doing this self work will really help you get clarity on them. Because it, there's no shame in moving and 
you know, switching professions or going to a different school or working in some other way of education, but it is a real shame when students um, are unhappy because they don't feel that you genuinely love and appreciate them. They need that. So at this point, I would like you all to type in the chat titles of books, podcasts, articles that you use to do the self work. And in the Q&A, we'll have some time for questions. Chantel, are there yes. some questions coming in or are we? Just giving it a second for a couple okay. of seconds. Yeah. So, so we've got White Fragility, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, so that book, mm -hmm. um, NPR Code Switch podcast, mm. Grading for Equity by Jay Feldman. Mm -hmm. Um, waking up white uh, uh, was recommended to somebody. Um, the Global Oneness Project, uh, another mention for Zaretta Hammond. Um, for white folks who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too. <laughs> That's a great title. <laughs> um, yes, the Nice White Parents podcast. I know the Actful Social Justice um, Special Interest Group is doing a, a discussion around that. If anyone's interested, I'll share that later in the chat when I get a sec. Um, White Rage, uh, Blue Flag is a series for students and instructors to reflect on self and identity. Um, Yo Puedo from Teacher Discovery. Let me see if I... Oh, so you want to talk about race? I thought I might have missed a couple. The Global Oneness Project, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm, I'm just now noticing some people are only posting this to the panelists. Um, so if you are posting, make sure you change your settings so that everyone can see them so that it's panelists and everybody else. But we will be collating all of these and sharing them as part of the record of the event. So if you've missed any of these, no worries. When we share the recording, you will also get these, these lists of resources that are coming up in the chat. Um, teaching tolerance, <laughs> of course. Um, push out the criminalization of black girls in schools. Ooh, a whole bunch came in, so it jumped. The inner work of social justice, the danger of a single story. Um, uh, then someone is sharing that they do, um, uh, they have a DEI at school and teaching tolerance. Um, the special interest groups from Actful, how to be a white ally, protection of right, uh, the book cast, me and white supremacy. Uh, combat racism, change the world, and become a good ancestor. These are Another great. Call out for Yo Puedo. Are there any questions in the Q and A? There, there are a couple questions that have come up. Yes. So one you hit upon, but I think it's still worth asking, mm -hmm. which is the question of how you see social justice relating to transformative learning and critical pedagogy. Um, and Anna notes that in all of these approaches, students are responsible for their learning. How would, what do you see as the differences between them? Oof, that is a big, <laughs> I, you know, I honestly, I think that there's a lot of overlap in all of these. And, and for me, the bottom line is as long as you are disrupting predictable outcomes, you're teaching for social justice. Um, and I don't think, I think the reason why definitions become important is when we get into those things of like, um, you know, culturally responsive teaching is seeing that as like, oh, I'm a culturally responsive teacher. I have like all these different people represented in my curriculum. That's where it gets a little problematic because no, culturally responsive teaching is really, really about, um, is really about creating independent learners, right? But as far as social justice, I kind of feel, which is for me under the umbrella of social justice. So I kind of envision social justice as this big umbrella and all those other strategies fit within it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So in some ways these are all different frameworks or approaches that overlap and share that same goal of social yeah. justice. Um, and and I'll let us know if that didn't quite answer the question. Um, Maria has a question about, if you have uh, students coming from minority groups, and the example she gives is Native Americans, um, but who's, who are not doing well in a world language class, um, do you have strategies for helping that student to become more successful using transformative learning, using social justice pedagogy? Yeah, I mean, I think the big one is, um, that's a big question because it, and to answer the question just as it is, I would say, 
I would do some reflection on what is my relationship with those students. And I would do some reflection on this question of, do students feel like learning Spanish is for them? Do, do they feel a sense of belonging in this classroom? Do they see other Spanish speakers who look like them? Is there maybe a different language that they're pa more passionate about learning? And if so, can you have a conversation with that student about how, you know, learning one language is gonna help you learn the next language. I mean, I had a student one time, this is a slightly different example, but she was passionate about learning Gaelic. She did not wanna learn Spanish. She was a seventh grader with a really strong will and she was, you know, she just wasn't. And so one of the compromises that we made was, okay, you are present in Spanish class for, you know, this amount of time and the last 10 minutes of class, here's Duolingo, learn Gaelic, you know? So, um, but I would really look at like, kind of try to find out what are the root causes? What's, what's going on there? Yeah, thank you. And then uh, one last question that we have here, which I think is an important one because it comes up, I think it's come up in every single one of these webinars and it's an important one to ask, which is um, the question of when you have students who express discomfort um, with issues of race or gender equality or any of these issues related to social justice, um, how do you approach that or how do you deal with students who, um, who, are, who are expressing different varieties of discomfort with that being part of their language classroom? I, th I normalize it. I, I just say, you know, this is, this is going to happen and that's okay. It happens for adults. Adults would rather talk about their sex lives than talk about race. Like, you know, like that's really like, I, I don't say that to students, but <laughs> in the purpose of this webinar, <laughs> um, <laughs> I would just say, you know, um, I did have a student, so I was teaching a, a lesson on a unit on Black Lives Matter. This was actually in an English language arts class. And one of the activities was to role play and the student did not want to role play a black person. They didn't want to do it. And again, you know, eighth grade student, you have to kind of meet the student where they're at. And I, I really believe in the power of one-on-one -on -one conversation because that way a lot of these issues come up and it's like, um, the defensiveness that comes up, if you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you can lessen that for students. Um, you can get at the root of like, what are, what are the emotions coming up for the student? What are the beliefs that they have? And so for me, when students, the first step is to normalize it, say everybody, you know, everybody, this is a tough topic. Everybody has a, has a hard time talking about it. Um, and then, the second step is for students who are really, really struggling, have a conversation with them. Yeah, that makes sense. Also making it, making it intentional rather than just kind of putting it under the rug. Yeah. Making it overt. We do have one more question that cropped up if you're willing to take sure. it, because it might yeah. also even be a segue um, to what else you're going to talk about. But the question is, um, how do we make social justice visible in the curriculum and in our classroom? Oh, that's a beautiful segue. <laughs> I think I'm going to answer it by kind of just moving forward with the Perfect. presentation. Yeah. So, um, okay. So the next part is students. And again, a quote from my, um, from Elena Aguilar, <laughs> the solution to educational inequity is not to help students navigate a dysfunctional system that was never designed for them. So the first thing I want to, I want to talk about is disrupting predictable systems in your schools. And this is something where you're going to have to do a little bit of self work too, because you're going to have to figure out what is within my sphere of influence, what is within my sphere of control, and what is just totally not in sphere of influence or control. Um, and then I'm just going to read this quote. This is from I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. And she writes, white institutions are constantly communicating how much blackness they want. It begins with numbers. How many scholarships are being offered? How many seats are being saved for neighborhood kids? How many black bodies must be present for us to have good diversity numbers? How many people of color are needed for the website, the commercials, the pamphlets? And one thing that I love about Channing Brown's work is that she points out 
that oftentimes so much of the social justice work that we white folks uh, do is about making ourselves feel better as white people. And this is good information for me because it can help with the self-reflection piece. One of the things that we have to be aware of is that as a white person, it's very easy for me to slip into white saviorism or martyrdom. Um, and to avoid this, we need to reflect on our motivations and intentions. So the question is, are we challenging a particular system that's set up in our school to make ourselves look like the most woke white person in the room? or for the students that it could benefit. Um, so the questions that, can we get curious about these things? What are the ways in which your institution is sending implicit messages about identity? What are the explicit and implicit messages about who belongs and who doesn't? And how can we get curious about that? Can you notice who, who's taking AP, for example? Who knows about the travel opportunities and can access them? Um, who knows about seal of biliteracy? How do systems and, and like course, how does like tracking, is there tracking at your school? Um, are all students and families aware of the benefits of certain tracks of learning? And so for systems, the recommendation is instead of trying for good diversity numbers, let's get curious about the barriers between your black and brown students and their academic potential. And then let's set about removing them. So the next thing that I want us to think about is disrupting the predict predictable curriculum. So what do you consider the basics? Now we're gonna get more, like I, I realized the first part of this presentation is really applicable to all, all teachers, right? This is like, we're getting into the stuff that's applicable specifically to us as world language teachers. Um, and, you know, what words does your curriculum use to teach hair? Curly, wavy, straight, or are there, or the basics, are those more expansive? So you, you start this work by doing a curriculum analysis. Look at your textbook, look at your um, program, whatever it is that you're learning, and then you start to get curious, like you notice things, and you are really asking the question, what isn't there? not just the information that is there, but what, where are their gaps? Um, so my colleague, Nick Verbon and I, re he really helped me to look critically at the curriculum that we were using. Um, the words to teach hair were very Eurocentric. And so Nick spent the time to create, to amplify that curriculum. He created um, a whole gallery of images and words that really expanded our definition of what it meant to teach the basics when it came to hair and skin color and other things. Um, and so then later we reflected, oh my gosh, it would have been so much better next time we do this, we're going to have the students write down all the words that they use in English to describe their own hair. And then we'll create a vocabulary bank of those words in Spanish, right? So, and I wanna be clear, like the school that we teach at is predominantly white. And so, um, but it's really important. Those students also need to hear the message that learning words for dreads and braids and box braids, that's part of the basics too. Um, some women who do this really, really well, if you have not heard of Elevate Educational Consulting with Rochelle Adams and Anna Gilcher, they often have presentations at ACTFL. They have a document that's really helped me with this. It's called Diversity Positive Adjectives. And they really help shift our focus, like beyond just the norm, there it is, right? What we consider the normal words. Why are those just the normal words? So expanding your curriculum, curriculum analysis, asking that question, what do you consider the basics? Another way that you can disrupt the curriculum is by the stories that you choose to tell. So there, we're not, we don't really have time to watch them, but there's two um, videos linked here. The first one is about Japanese Mexicans. And the second one is a really powerful story that I learned um, about a group of Afro-Mexicans called Los Negros Mascogos. And Los Negros Moscogos live in a tiny, tiny town called El Nacimiento, which is outside of Musquis, which is outside of Saltillo, in the state of Coahuila. It's a northern state in Mexico. And their story, just very briefly, is 
a story of resistance and resilience. Um, they are the descendants of people who were enslaved from Africa and people who were enslaved, um, indigenous people who were enslaved in what is now the continental United States. And for those of you who may not be aware, Mexico abolished slavery before the United States did. And so many people, when they were escaping, they escaped south. So these two, the, the Kickapoo tribe and um, some escaped um, enslaved people from Africa, they banded together, they fled south to what to them was the land of the free, and they petitioned the governor to establish their town here. And this documentary, Gertrudis Blues, she, um, Doña Gertrudis has since passed, but she was the matriarch of that town for a long time and she really kept their traditions alive. Those traditions include singing songs that reminded me of spirituals, eating foods, like their, their Spanish is peppered with indigenous words and, and their food is like this mix of all three cultures. It's a really, really beautiful, very empowering story. Um, contrast that with a story in, uh, with a story about uh, Coyolillo, which is a small town outside of Jalapa in the state of Veracruz where I worked. And this was a story that was, um, a Mexican news channel made this story. So you have every reason to maybe trust it. But the story went something like this. Oh, look at these poor uh, kids in Coyolillo. They don't go to school and their only recourse is to go to the United States to work a life of hard labor. And it's like, well, A, that's not true. I worked, I spent a lot of time working with, um, working with university students who are from the town of Coyolillo, who are activists in their town, actively changing the, the narratives and the outcomes for people there. And, and B, like, is that really a story that our kids need to hear? So, you know, one of my biggest mistakes when I first got into this was thinking that social justice teaching was telling about all the ways that people oppress other people. And that's just like, you know, that's not, I think, especially now, especially in these times, my current understanding of social justice teaching means that we are giving students blueprints for resilience and joy and optimism. And we are surfacing stories that show resistance and resilience. So one of the things that I also wanted to highlight is that I think it's really important that we have a social justice goal. And that goal can be a goal that you use for the whole year, it can be for a unit, but those goals will really help guide you. So this is a quote from Stacey Johnson and her amazing We Teach Languages podcast. And she says, we can't do everything. So what's feasible in the time that we have? What will build connections? What will plant seeds to bear fruit later? Your job is not to finish the work or force the results, it's to plant the seeds. So that's really powerful to me because, you know, I've had a lot of discussions with colleagues about, especially at the novice level, like, how do we do this work? We know novice level language, you're not talking about abstract things. So how are we ever going to talk about the complex identities of race in Mexico at the novice level? And my answer to that is create a social justice goal. Let's say it is you want to create more representation. You want to expand students' ideas of what, um, of what Mexicans look like, right? You want to represent all, show students that there are many races in Mexico um, and many ethnicities and many identities. Great. So with that goal in mind, that will help you decide when do you give students a New York Times article or an article that in English that gives them background information on that. Right? If it's not helping you meet that goal, then maybe leave that out. Um, and you know, just kind of a word that like I've been thinking about as well. Like we, we sometimes have to be careful about these things that we get really amped and excited about, like these TED Talks and these, these news articles, and then we give them to students and they're just like, you know, not as jazzed about them. So we need to also allow space for students to tell, tell us what they want to see and what they want to learn and about their worlds. All right, so I am looking at time and so I'm gonna kind of speed up a little bit more, but I do wanna talk to you about a lesson I did do with my novice students and it was called Dibuja Mexico, so Draw Mexico. 
And basically what I had students do is um, at the end of one lesson, I gave them about 10 minutes and I said, I want you to draw everything that you think of when you think of Mexico. So students drew uh, beaches, they drew deserts, they drew, you know, people from the movie Coco, they drew sunshine, um, sombreros, all of these things, right? I collected their drawings and then I made a little survey. And the next day, the lesson was a gallery walk and students had to walk around the classroom and track how many people drew cacti, how many people drew a beach, how many people drew a sunny location. So they're reading these questions in Spanish, they're looking at their, you know, their peers' drawings, and then we're talking about them in Spanish. We're talking about numbers, we're talking about nouns, and we're surfacing some of the ideas or stereotypes students might have about Mexico through their drawings. The next step of this lesson would be to complicate that a little bit and ask them, what don't you see? And so on the next day, there was a different set, there was a different gallery walk. There were images of, Afro-Mexicans, of Japanese Mexicans, of cold, of people being bundling up because there's places in Mexico where it gets really, really cold. And these are not the images that students either experience when they travel to Mexico in general or that they see on TV. The final recommendation for disrupting the predictable isolation is collaboration. Um, so individualism and isolation these are characteristics of whiteness and that's one of the ways that whiteness shows up in our schools and it's something that we can actively notice and plan for and i have to like admit you know my first my first 10 years teaching i was the only spanish teacher in my school building so collaboration had to i had to get creative on that i had to like look within my portland community for different groups who i could collaborate with um, but it's super super important because i will tell you one thing that i'm noticing right now it's kind of a funny irony but um, i have about three or four teachers at my school who are um, using the amazing the wonderful and amazing ted talk the danger of a single story and it's great, but we need to collaborate so that we know, so that we can deepen students learning, right? And we can expand on that wonderful TED talk, right? And we know which teachers are teaching it and when and what students have seen it. And you know, it, it's messy, it's not gonna be perfect. Students are gonna see it again. Okay, so they see it again. But we also like through collaboration, we can really deepen students learning and really take them to another level. All right, so the comment piece is emotions that are coming up for you right now. Um, so maybe Chantel, we can wait for that and just read a few of the emotions and then also questions about this piece because I know I'm, I'm going a little bit quicker because <laughs> during this time. All right, I'll give everyone a moment here to post. There's been a lot of enthusiasm about the diversity positive adjectives. So I know that a lot of the discussion has been about those. <laughs> That's actually maybe a good starting point. So motivation on the one hand, but also feeling a bit overwhelmed uh, that uh, there's so much to do where to start. Mm -hmm. Motivation and happiness, guilt, mm -hmm. hope. Yeah. Um, encouraged, um, and that's specifically by someone who says they're half Mexican, half French, who teaches languages. So I think some of these also speak to maybe things that we knew were missing or, or th things from our own classroom that uh, we knew we needed to do differently. So I'm hearing that and what a couple of people are sharing. Negligent, yeah, hopeful. Um, that it, the, a sense that we can become active agents of change in our schools by doing this, so empowered. Yeah. Inspired. I think I do wanna briefly address overwhelm and I wanna, um, like the word of the year is grace people. We are all teaching in this crazy setup. Some of us are, we were talking about this before the presentation started. Some of us are full hybrid or are hybrid. Some of us are full online. Some of us are like trying to teach online and then also have some students who are offline. So like, I really, really want everybody to just take a deep breath and know that the word of the year is grace. And you only have to do one small thing. Just the way you start is by choosing one small thing to do. And then 
you'll be able to build on that. And that is particularly for new teachers. I need to, like, when I first started teaching, I would read the articles in Rethinking Schools and I would do, and I'd just be like, oh my God, these teachers are so fabulous. And they, you know, like they can't do any of, I can't do any of this stuff. And I'm, you know, drowning in grading. And so then we take a deep breath and you just do one small thing. And I promise you, five years from now, you will notice that you've done five million small things. And that's how we, that's how we start. That's how we dig into this work. I, I suspect part of the reason that people were also really responding to the idea of introducing the diversity positive adjectives and asking students what adjectives they use as a starting point is that feels to, to me anyway, that feels like something that I could do right away that is, a, is an example of a starting point. Um, I know Veronica put this in the uh, comments rather than questions, um, but had shared the idea of also having students seek out alternative stories that students can also um, help us to disrupt yes. the expectations and to introduce new stories, which I thought was also really helpful. I like that, Veronica. We have a couple of um, questions, if you don't mind. Do you want to take those now, too? Yeah. Oh, people are liking the idea of grace being the word of the year as well. Um, Marcy, I see you asking about the name of the TED Talk. I think somebody actually posted that in the chat, so I'll make sure that that gets um, bumped up again, but it is there. Um, and then Cynthia is asking, you, you said that isolation and individualism are white traits, and she said, sorry if that's not the best explanation. Um, how do you approach that with teaching in the classroom without offending students, and offending is in scare quotes, um, and then uh, how do you see the president's executive order from last week affecting your teaching, if at all? Or I guess maybe the question is in part, do you feel constrained by uh, policies? Um, maybe we can take federal as well as local. Um, do you feel answerable to any of this to higher powers, <laughs> orders yeah. and policies? No, I, I hear that. And I guess I say that, you know, um, well, Portland has been in the news a lot lately <laughs> for, for our liberalism in particular. Um, and though I have not directly experienced everything that is in the news, I, I will say this, that Portland Public Schools is a di district that has a commitment to equity. And so there is a lot of support for this work at various levels. Um, and so if you are in a district that is not supportive or that, um, yeah, where there's policies or, you know, orders from above that you cannot do this work, again, my recommendation would be to find like-minded individuals and start with one small thing. Maybe it's the diversity positive adjectives. Maybe it's, um, you know, telling a different story in your, maybe it's a curriculum analysis. Maybe it's, maybe your small thing is just doing your own self work, right? Um, there's 24 hours in a day. We, we cannot do it all. And especially when there's like people pushing up against us saying that you should not do it all. So really also being clear about your emotions that are coming up for you and when you're starting to feel drained um, and, and burnt out and, and taking care of yourself in those times. Um, and then uh, Chantel, can you, the, the, the earlier question about the isolation, it was, it was, I'm sorry, I'm, it was that all one question, did I answer that okay? <laughs> yes, yes, and well, they were, they were two questions both coming from the same person. Okay. Um, I think maybe part of the question is just this, this idea that um, kind of examining whiteness, mm. how, do you, how do you bring that into the classroom without offending students and and Cynthia put offending in scare quotes which I think is kind of a, a there's a cautiousness there but that how do you how do you respond to that pushback from students so my initial response is when we examine when I examine whiteness I it's it's a really it's really a self-reflection piece right um just it's about seeing the ways that I, that my identity markers are setting my students up for success or not based on my beliefs and based on my conditioning in whiteness. So I think the first step is before you introduce that idea with students, you need to get really clear on what whiteness is and how it operates and how it operates in yourself. 
you know what? I think I need some more time to think about how I, I think the way that whiteness shows up in discussions with students is through storytelling and through, yeah. So, but I think I do need some more time to think about that question, how I would approach it with students. You know, I have a, a colleague who is, she's working on bilingual um, curriculum for fifth grade level. And the way it's showing up for her is she wrote a personal story about when, you know, she's a white woman and she wrote her story about being a young girl and like having all these questions about race and her parents not wanting to talk about that. And her saying, no, no, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about this. So that's kind of my, my initial take on that. But I, I would like some time to think about it. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll get your email and we can, we can have a longer discussion. That sounds good. I know, and I know a couple of people are also sharing in the chat um, mm -hmm. uh, some ideas there about just kind of reflecting on one's own positionality, which is something you talked about as well. And mm -hmm. uh, reflecting, reflecting on on the other as well that other that other stories might be different from your own yeah i think that's all the questions for now okay yeah. oh something says thank you so i think you did answer her question okay <laughs> and we'll make sure you get the email address <laughs> yes thank you cynthia um okay so the last segment is world and the quote for this segment is the best antidote to anxiety is action and so I'm going to tell you, when I originally envisioned this presentation, world was going to be a different piece. It was going to be about, you know, expanding outside of the US and all of these things. And then um, September happened. And those of you, I'm not, I'll just go ahead and say, because I know different people are, our relationships with the news is changing and I'm hoping that people are are following the news enough to know what's going on and also taking breaks because it's overwhelming right now. But Portland in the first couple of weeks of September was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. Um, we had wildfires raging all up and down the west coast and um, I didn't even, you know, living in the city, I did not experience the brunt of it. Uh, my house did not burn down. I did not have to evacuate. But I did experience a full week of living in smoke that was so thick, I could not see to the end of my block. And that was terrifying. And so at that moment, I realized that the world piece of this presentation is really bringing up the topic of climate justice as social justice, as racial justice. Because we know that climate, the climate crisis is affecting people of color at a higher rate than anyone else. We know that the United States is, uh, despite, <laughs> we, we know all the things about the United States, what we're doing wrong, right? Despite being a major polluter, we are just now, and I use just now loosely, within this last decade, really, really experiencing the brunt of the climate crisis. And so in Portland Public Schools, we do actually have a resolution on the books, Resolution 5272, and it's about teaching students to be climate literate. And one of, the, one of the lines in the resolution says, students should develop confidence and passion when it comes to making a positive difference in society and come to see themselves as activists and leaders when it comes to environmental justice. So for the world section, I'm gonna challenge us to disrupt predictable climate change, right? Because scientists have been saying for years, this is gonna happen and now it's happening with climate literacy. Um, and climate literacy is teaching students to name the causes of the climate crisis and then telling empowering stories that show students how to be change makers. Um, I want to give a shout out to these women. I attended their actual presentation in 2019. They had a presentation called Planting Seeds and they are a Spanish, French, and um, Mandarin teacher who have I mean, like the collaboration that these women have done is 
amazing. I dream about this level of collaboration. They have aligned their world lang language curriculum um, vertically, so grades one through five, I believe, and horizontally. So all of the, the Mandarin, the French, and the Spanish teacher are teaching towards the same goals of climate literacy within the context of world language. It was amazing. And it was, I, I might have missed it because there are, are over 300 or more, 800 presentations at ACTFL, but it was one of the few dedicated to climate justice and we need more. So this is from their presentation. Um, and they had some of, they named some of these goals for their students. They wanted students to see themselves as part of nature, connected to other humans, culture, and life on earth. They wanted students to see themselves as agents of change. They wanted students to be able to name the symbolic universe and name our in inter interconnectedness, sorry, and name the injustice. And so I just wanna point out to us that like, novice level language students can do this as well. They do not need advanced level language or advanced level goals to do this. We can still teach for climate justice with novice level goals. So some of those goals might be students will develop an appreciation for nature. If you teach in a very urbanized area where students don't get out and get in touch with nature much, this might be a really powerful goal for your students. Um, making connections, this is again a goal from the Planting Seeds presentation, making connections between our food habits and where we live, who we are, the climate we live in, using instead of like doing your traditional professions of doctor, teacher, banker, what if you did activist, what if you did, you know, climate change activist, what it, you know, we can, we can shift we can still meet our goals, our language learning goals, and just shift the perspective just a little bit. So here's the call to action. Because I have been thinking a lot about this idea of elsewhere lately. And in my life, in my education, teaching for social justice meant teaching about elsewhere. It meant teaching about struggle and injustice and revolutions that happened to other people in other places at other times. And if this pandemic has taught me one thing, it's this. There's no elsewhere. There's just here and now, and there's just us. Which is kind of inspiring. We're in this together. And so I wanna know who's with me who wants to collaborate on climate justice curriculum for world language students? Who knows curriculum that's great that's already out there? Can we spread the word about that curriculum and get it so that we are all having a moment where we're teaching students, where we're giving them a blueprint and a pathway to resilience? That's what I have for you all today. Any other last questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A. I am so grateful to have been, had this opportunity and to be with you this morning. Um, and I'm really excited to learn to increase my book list from the chat that you all typed up, typed up as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. I know people, you're getting a lot of uh, people saying they're in. Um, so let us know if you have any, any other questions that are remaining. I, I want to pick up on a couple of things that actually came up in the chat as comments, um, but I think might be interesting points of discussion um, still. One of them was from uh, Freddie, and it's kind of the flip side of Cynthia's question about how do you respond to policies that perhaps make you feel constrained? Um, because he was sharing that he's been asked in his program, and Freddie, you're going to tell me if I get this wrong, um, to use DEI language in the course catalogs. So to intentionally use language related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, but kind of as a policy decision to um, uh, kind of fulfill institutional compliance or accreditation compliance. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that kind of the, as the flip side of um, where that language gets used in institutional settings and kind of almost gets robbed of all of the emotion and intent that you've been talking about? 
Yeah, no, that's a good, thank you for bringing that up. That is a really good comment. Like I'm really worried about the term anti-racist education right now, for example. Um, and I, I'm worried about it because it seems like, well, I like to explain to students that words are alive. They're actually alive. They have, they are born and they have a life and sometimes it's a really long life and sometimes they, they die. No one says groovy anymore, right? Like our parents said that, but we don't anymore. At least not that I know of, but maybe, you know, like I'm getting old, so I don't know, maybe it made a comeback. Um, in terms of educational terms, I see this happening of like, you know, we know, I call them, it becomes interview speak. We know what we need to say in the interview to get the job. And I, I think that it is, it's not unimportant to use diversity, equity, and inclusion language in all publications. It matters. It means something. It says a message. It's sometimes, like our superintendent, he put out a beautiful message um, after after George Floyd, after his murder. And he, um, and that really emboldened some teachers because some teachers were like, hey, if the superintendent is saying this, then that gives me permission to teach for, teach for anti-racism, teach for social justice in my classroom setting. So I do think that the words matter, but my hope is that with webinars like these, with really critical loving, and by loving, I don't mean necessarily nice. I mean, loving like you have some spinach stuck in your teeth and I love you, so I'm gonna tell you about it. Conversations about race with our colleagues. My hope is that these words can have a longer shelf life and stay alive and really be put into practice. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, remembering that this is not a dichotomy between empty words and full mm -hmm. words, but it's more of a process in a lot of yeah. ways. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come up. so. Um, so, so Carolina's asking, um, and I think this is specific to Spanish, but I think we could probably find equivalents in other languages. So, um, how do you approach the fact that a black student cannot identify himself as soy negro in Spanish class, um, as a blonde student would say soy rubio? Um, so I think this in some ways ties back to the larger question of, uh, the ways in which even small words, the kind of taken for granted words can signal larger things. I think as an immediate answer, I would, you know, you always allow students to identify as they identify. And if they don't, you know, students do have reactions when they learn that the word for black in Spanish, negro, is negro, right, in English. And so, again, like prepping students for that, normalizing that. Um, and then also, if a student doesn't want to use that word, he doesn't have to use that word. They don't have to use that word like they can use other words um one of the things that i found during my fulbright research was that this whole like um gosh the word in spanish polemica the the whole like controversy over words is not just unique to us right so in um in mexico they have a lot of different words and infused with different tones and powers and meanings for Afro-Mexicans. Mm. So um, sometimes people prefer Afro-descendientes. In Coyolillo, there's a big sign that says Afro-Mestizo, which is kind of a, some other people have problems with that word. Um, some people say Negro, we're just gonna say Black because we're Black. Um, other people, you know, you see the memes that like, in, no soy tu negra, like I'm not your Black girl. Like, so it's, it's complex and so I depending upon what your social justice goal is I would maybe open up that discussion in English for students that is it's you know and but ultimately I would say the answer is you let students identify as they identify and to their comfort level yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think I see a couple people who are reminding us also that even in Spanish, it depends on which Spanish we're talking about and in which context. And yes, if people and have other, um, I just remember languages. And... Yeah. I know German it borrows a lot from English because a lot of the inspirations for community building come from uh, social movements in the States. And so a lot of the times you code switch when you're trying to. Oh, interesting. Identities. 
Um, so John is asking, he says, I'm a language teacher and my colleagues are usually concerned about uh, losing track of students' development of the language if we teach differently. I think this is also an important question that often comes up in these discussions and, and hasn't come up yet today. But the question of um, how do you address this, the question of inclusion of social justice in the classroom, especially vis-a-vis -vis, um, colleagues or others who might be saying, oh, is this taking up time from other goals like proficiency? I think the best way to, I mean, for myself, the way that I've had change in my practice is when I'm inspired by what other people are doing. So if I have colleagues who are maybe resistant because they're like really focused on, well, right now we're on the past participle and we need to teach that and we need to teach the conditional, I would suggest either finding curriculum where it's like two birds with one seed, like they are, look here, they're learning the conditional and also they're learning this goal. Or if you have the time and space to maybe do your own thing, develop that yourself and then say, hey, look at these results I got. Um, I could use some, some help on making this better for next time. Would you wanna collaborate with me on that? But it's hard, it's not easy, it's super, super tricky. I think that's helpful though. I mean, it, again, it's a, maybe not fixing it all right away, but what are the seeds? What are the steps that you can exactly. take in the direction? Um, there's a discussion going on in the chat still about the words that we choose. And it's a, I think for me, a good reminder that I'm gonna kind of put out there to see how you respond. That also, um, when we're thinking about word choice and things like diversity, positive adjectives, um, that it's, that not all words uttered by every person are the same. I, kind of a reminder of it depends on also who's saying it. It's not just what does the word mean, but who's saying it to whom in what context. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but that's kind of part of the discussion that's coming up there in the chat. Yes, I'm so thankful that you are surfacing that discussion. 100%. That's why the self-work is so important, like fundamental. Um, there are certain words that I will not say because of my racial identity. Um, there are certain words that if I say them are offensive, whereas if other people say them are not as offensive or are you know debatable um, or not so offensive. I mean, there's just a lot of, there is a lot, a lot of um, power that we invest in words because if you think about it, words are how we communicate our beliefs and beliefs are how we create our world. They're how we show, how we know how to show up in the world. It's all based on our beliefs. And the words are the ways we, we communicate that. So we do, I just, yeah, I don't know that I necessarily have anything other than that to add, but just like, that's why the self-work is so important. And, and yes, please, please, please know yourself and know and do some work on, on the words. I think that point of, words are how we show up in the world is a really good reminder as to why maybe the world language classroom is exactly what the place for having some of these discussions mm -hmm. um i and that's a maybe a good point to kind of start to wrap up i don't want to cut anyone off if they still have any questions and there's still a really active conversation going on in the chat i am going to direct your attention to so chill just shared the webinar evaluation um and she either did or will be she probably did and i just missed it because uh, I'm multitasking, but we'll have shared uh, also a link to a more open-ended survey. And the reason we have these two is, um, and I'm saying this to ask you and beg you all to complete both, um, is that the information you put in the webinar evaluation is really helpful for us um, for when we apply for future grants to host events like this, um, because that's the kind of information the Department of Education likes to see. Um, and then the open-ended survey that Sochi just shared, again, um, also provides us with um, a little bit richer information, and we can also pass that on to Michelle if she's interested, which I'm sure yes. she will be. <laughs> I, I, I do need to, I would like to say that I, I really do take feedback to heart and, you know, um, it is something like, especially as, like, as a white identifying woman, like feedback that I get that helps me examine um, where my whiteness is showing up. I do take that a heart to heart and I, and I reflect and take action on that. So I would really appreciate any, any feedback that you all have for me. Um, it would be accepted with much appreciation and gratitude. 
Yes. Yeah, so please do take a couple of minutes to do that open ended. We, we use that. It's very valuable for us as well as a center. Um, I, I just know that the, the poll feels a little bit more constricting. Um, so I want to explain that's why we have both and why it's important is that um, slightly more quantitative data is also helpful for us <laughs> for various reasons. Um, I'm seeing lots of people saying thank you and how wonderful this webinar has been. So I want to take this chance. We'll keep things going just a little longer in case people want to share still, um, but maybe we'll go ahead and I'll ask you all your silence. So I will clap for all of us. Um, but if you can join me, please, in thanking Michelle for this really wonderful webinar and for all the ideas and resources that she shared with us today. <laughs>